we're very pleased to have a panel this morning of uh, Oklahoma senators and representatives, and I'd like for you to please join me in welcoming our panel members from the state senate, uh, Senator David Holt. And from the House, Representatives Lee Denny and Scott Biggs. I'm sneaking in the back door. We get uh, unlimited so far. We don't have to get a lot of people coming. You want us to move? Down? Is it just the three of us? I think it is. Just we can the move three closer of you. to you, yeah. Dan. We were following instructions. Come on down. <laughs> I showered and everything this morning. Okay. <coughs> so I know the bell rings at nine this morning, so we'll, uh, we'll get right to it. Thank you again for being part of our morning panel. Again, our focus today is gonna be on several legislative issues of interest to participants at this conference. And I'd like to start with what has been a repeated effort at the state capitol to strengthen Oklahoma's exotic animal laws. Uh, there have been several attempts to prohibit private ownership of dangerous wild animals and or breeding, including a bill that was introduced this year that failed to get a hearing in committee, and none of the others have made it uh, past the committee stage. And my opening question to you is, why has the legislature not taken action on this issue? Well, I believe we did have one House bill this year dealt with exotic animals and banning the, uh, the hunting of them in Oklahoma. That was Representative Vaughn and Representative Dunlap's bill. Uh, that passed the House pretty overwhelmingly and is now in the uh, Senate Ag Committee, if I understand right. So it's not that the House hasn't taken up these issues. Um, the, the exotic animal, we had an incident where a, a location was selling hunts where they darted the animals and you get your picture taken. That's what this bill addressed specifically, was making sure those type of practices aren't present here in Oklahoma. Okay. Um, I was just going to add, I agree with uh, Representative Biggs. Um, a lot of times when you ask the question of why we haven't done something, it's more or less um, good legislation usually takes three to four years to get passed. Uh, and that's because we come from all different walks of life. And so it's an education that has to take place. And so um, sometimes to the public that seems like we should be acting on things a little faster than we do, but there's a learning curve uh, in the House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, to get up to speed of what the real issue is because believe it or not for every idea that's out there There's somebody that's going to oppose the idea and so since we all come from different walks of life um, It's easy to vote no on something or not hear something until you understand something So that's kind of the process and why it takes a little while to get good legislation passed Senator, Holt. Sometimes it seems like it's a miracle that we ever pass any bills at all because yeah. <laughs> When you think about what it has to go through, you have to have first a champion who even wants to work on this issue. You know, I mean, we as a body don't uh, write bills. It takes an individual uh, to, to author a bill, and then you've got to convince a committee chairman to hear it, and maybe two committee chairmen, and then you've got to hear it on the floor, and then you've got to go to the other chamber and do the same thing. And, and um, so I don't know the details of this. They know more about this issue than I, but but it is, it is a challenge to pass anything. So um, the fact that something's through the House, you know, should be encouraging. Now it's already been brought up at the conference that as other states have cracked down on uh, exotic pet ownership, Oklahoma is going to attract um, a, a growing problem, if you will, as people who seek to own these animals move them to, to Oklahoma. First of all, do you see that as a problem? And if so, uh, what's the solution? Well, any time uh, a state attracts any type of activity that is undesirable, it, it uh, comes to the state, it kind of comes under the cover of darkness, it's, it's uh, done outside of the eyes of a lot of individuals in the state, so it does take a while for it to reach that uh, level of uh, importance that it comes to our attention or it comes to the public's attention. Um, so any kind of overt activity that is comes to the state, I think we would be worried about. I'm always, I always go back to the puppy mill era of uh, that was done a lot in rural Oklahoma where a lot of people didn't see until it became to the level that citizens across the state thought it was a problem, that's when we started to act on it. So as this becomes more of a problem, I'm like Senator Holt, um, 
kind of unaware of the huge problem it is. I feel kind of bad sitting on a panel realizing <laughs> it's a huge problem. But uh, so it's something that I'll need to get educated on. And uh, certainly uh, my constituents out here and, and uh, people across the state, they need to have this relationship with their state legislator, whether it be a senator or a representative. And if there's problems of any kind, this happens to be an animal welfare problem, if this happens to be a problem, then you need to have that relationship with your legislator that you can make them aware of the problem that it's become. Right. Don't ever assume we know what exactly. you're interested in, and don't ever assume that we're inaccessible. Most of us uh, are actually pretty accessible, and, and uh, I, it's always amazing to me when I call somebody back and they say, oh, I can't believe you called me back, and like I'm so, <laughs> so hard to reach, you know. It's really just, you can just walk into our offices Absolutely. and talk to us about these issues. So, um, yeah, I hope this is uh, an opportunity to learn uh, on both sides of the aisle. Mr. Senator Bitt. Well, it, it's you know kind of comical. I haven't been in as long as you know, Senator Holt and Pro Tem Denny, but you know the day you got elected, you have to be an expert in all issues. <laughs> and, you know, and the first thing you learn is you're, I'm not. You know, I recognize I'm not an expert, but I need people who are. And then so if you surround yourself and you talk to the people that are knowledgeable about an issue, mm -hmm. uh, you, you you can get stuff done. You know, I live in a, a rural setting outside of Stillwater. Anyone from Stillwater today? Well, now, <laughs> my constituent. <laughs> there you go. Um, and, and I live out on a couple of acres, and it's, uh, we, I, you know, I have neighbors, et cetera. But what I don't know is, uh, you know, it, do I have a neighbor that owns an exotic pet? And I wouldn't know that. I have no way of knowing that. Uh, there's no way to track that. Um, what about the idea of getting a handle on where the exotic pets are in Oklahoma uh, through legislation? You mean like a like a <coughs> exotic pet registry, like uh, like almost like a sex offender registry? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. As, some, as somebody, as somebody who lives out in a rural setting, I, you know, I, I would really like to know if I've got a neighbor that has a, a, a bear or a. Just to ask the question, it's since you're from Ohio, was this a city thing or a statewide? Statewide. Okay. So any other thoughts about, about what you've heard or, or about the idea of, of getting a handle on where the exotic pets are? I was under the impression, as, as this gentleman pointed out, I, I do know of two lions in my district. Uh, but um, I was under the impression there were some state laws 
that did uh, command how they were housed. Okay. So speaking of breeders, what do you see uh, are, as the prospects uh, for a future um, breeder ban on exotic cats in Oklahoma? We really should be out there, and these people should be up here. <laughs> <laughs> are you getting that sense? <laughs> what do y'all think? That's I don't know how we train? About exotic pets. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I think that's good. I mean, I, that's why we're here, I guess. So. We're learning about exotic yeah. pets, but you may want to move to the next topic because we're. <laughs> Was there another question from the audience? You need to repeat that. The door shut, and we didn't hear you. Recently took in a what? I think our lack of knowledge about exotic pets is indicative of the fact that the legislature obviously has not taken up this issue in any great, uh, any great way. So interesting. Yeah. Um, another issue that, that has uh, gotten little traction at, at the Capitol um, is a proposed ban on the use of gas as a method to, to euthanize animals in, in Oklahoma animal shelters. And it's my understanding that a lot have converted to lethal injection, but there still are some that, that use gas. Uh, the measure has been introduced uh, for the past couple of years, but has, has failed both times, and I'm, I'm wondering kind of what the sticking points are there. I actually do uh, know something bill. about yes. this. Uh, so I, uh, I ran that bill last year and uh, uh, passed it through. So, so this would have banned municipal animal shelters from um, <clears throat> euthanizing dogs and cats with um, what is it? I knew this stuff like the back of my hand a year ago. What kind of gas? Uh, Car carbon, carbon, monoxide. carbon monoxide, yes. Uh, because we were hearing horror stories that some cities would even, uh, from, from your colleague, Representative Rendiger, would tell me how when he first arrived in McAllister, they would back a car up to, the, to a box you know, that they put the dogs and cats in, and that's how they would euthanize them. And this, this was fairly horrific to me. So uh, I knew, uh, as I researched the issue, that there weren't that many um, and if I recall, one of them was, is in or was in your district. And they've since changed their method. <laughs> okay. um, you got their attention. <laughs> and, and, and so we, we passed the bill through the Senate. Uh, Representative Reniger, a veterinarian, was the author in the House. Um, it stalled there. Um, he told me that he felt, um, I don't know, you would know better than I what happened over there, but, but he told me that he felt that he had gotten people's attention and that actually the few remaining cities that were doing it, most of them had, had switched over, that we did get some attention last year when this bill was moving through the process and, and that maybe it's not being done anywhere in Oklahoma but uh, anymore. Uh, that doesn't mean I wouldn't like to, to see um, that law eventually pass, but we, we didn't mount the effort again this year after last year. But as you said, it did draw attention to it, and he's speaking about the, the town of Cushing, Oklahoma, which happens to be my hometown, and it drew so much attention statewide that they since have banned that practice. They're going to um, injectable euthanasia, but it spurned the whole conversation, and now they've just passed a bond issue to build a new animal shelter, and uh, things are progressing nicely. They've had a horrific 
a horrific situation as far as an animal shelter. And I think a lot of small towns are like that. And so just having the conversation, even though we didn't get a law on the books, and sometimes we're hesitant about putting laws on the books until we're fully informed, um, it got the attention, I think, that you would desire as a group, and things are being done to rectify these situations in, in small rural Oklahoma. And, and that's one of the things I've learned. I, you know, I, I'm the short timer here, uh, but it doesn't take a bill to make something happen. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the prime example I learned this year was when a, a state agency was trying to shut down the farmer's market there at Department of Ag. And I know we got a lot of people from out of state, but in front of our Department of Ag, we have a, a community garden type setting where students come, they plant crops, Department of Ag then has a farmer's market, and we had a state agency trying to shut them down. So, you know, what's the first thing I do? You, you run a bill. You know, we, let's make sure we authorize that. And all it took was people sitting down at the table when once that bill got filed, and next thing you know, we have a letter saying you, your farmer's market, you know, is protected from here on out. We'll grant an exception. Uh, and so that, I think that's key. As you said, yeah. only three three shelters now use gas, and they don't use the car gas. You know, that's illegal, that's against the laws. The DA comes out at me, we charge those people with, with animal cruelty. Uh, but there's only three now where there were six two years ago. So. And, and Kelly, it was interesting in that process, you did have interests that were not directly affected or, or any way affected by it that were concerned about the law, though, because they were doing practices like that, not with cars, but with the more humane method, but it was still carbon monoxide with, uh, if I recall, pigs, and, um, and and they came and visited me. Now, they laid down their arms, but I do recall we had to do some language changes to make them uh, satisfied. So it's, in, it's, it's just an illustration of how things often work. I mean, there's you, you do something thinking you know who will be the opponents, and then you find that there are other interested parties who may be concerned about a slippery slope and, and all those things. And so we, we dealt with that um, through that that issue too. Any plans to try again? No. <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of times the way it works at the Capitol, I pass it through the Senate, you know, I think if, if uh, any of these folks or Representative Renniger wanted to try it on in the House again, I'd be their Senate author, but, um, you know, uh, something like that where, where the need is lessening every year, um, I would certainly keep trying if I felt like it was a different situation, maybe. But I, I'm, I'm somewhat convinced by the response and the feedback that I've gotten from people like Representative Renninger that it is all but extinct in Oklahoma. You say, uh, did you say there's three that you know that are still doing Three. Well, we should. And <laughs> well, and because I mean, I mean, they may be working out of it, as, as my hometown did. They may be, this may have drawn enough attention to it that these last three may be working out of it and just haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, I think that's... And, and I'm, I'm going to put this back on you. If you're from Norman and representing Virgin and representing Martin, I'm, I'm Senator Sparks, I believe, mm -hmm. is from Norman. Standridge. Uh, and Standridge. Uh, you need to have that relationship with them as well to uh, let, your, let your thoughts be known. Uh, but if it's a new facility, um, again, I've not studied a lot of this because I've always euthanized by lethal injection. Um, there are appropriate ways to use it. We're not backing up a car anymore. I mean, this was back in the 70s. Um, and I don't know whatever made cities do that. That never seems like a good plan. But uh, the new gas chambers and used appropriately meet the AVMA standards, American Veterinary Medical Standards of operation. And so that may be uh, what they're planning to do. And, all the, and if it's not desirable to you, 
then I would encourage you as well to speak to your representatives because believe it or not, they're gonna listen to you more than they're gonna listen to me <laughs> because you have the power at the voting booth for them. Does that make sense? I always wanna engage people with your legislators because it just works so much better when you have that personal relationship. I would hope you would have uh, whichever one's your representative, their phone number in your phone. I have Scott's here if you want it. <laughs> I have Emily's too. No. Uh, but seriously, that's, this works better at the grassroots level when you engage your own legislator um, because I'm from a little bitty town of 8,000 people. Why would someone in a town of 100,000 people really care what I say? They care what you say because you vote for them. Well, I'm just giving a, that's true. I'm just giving a macroscopic view. Perfect. And, and Representative uh, Griffin filed this bill this year. But Representative Griffin did file this bill this year, and you may contact her and ask her because you know it was assigned to one of the committees I'm on, and I don't believe she ever requested it to get a hearing. So, <laughs> so hand over here. Well, I think I'd like to start by just uh, asking uh, Representative Biggs to give us an overview of what House Joint Resolution 1012 does and why it's needed. Okay. Uh, House Joint Resolution 1012 has been called the right to farm. Um, despite what some media has been saying, it is not a, an ELEC conference sponsored bill. It was not a bill that was sponsored by an out-of-state lobbyist. It was a bill that I crafted with some other members uh, three years ago. You say laws take, over, take time. This bill has been in the process, been in the works three years. Um, and what it does is protects the rights of farmers and ranchers here in Oklahoma. Uh, in Oklahoma, ag is, you know, ag and oil are the number one and two industries in Oklahoma. Uh, the reason I believe it is so important is, you know, growing up for myself, I, it was before the days of uh, cell phones and video games that I got off the school bus and I, I went and rode horses with my grandparents, my parents. Went fishing every every chance I got. My daughter's not the same way. I got I got a four year old and a five month old. You know, and I want to make sure they have the same opportunities that I had growing up when it comes to agriculture. You know, the same opportunities to to show horses, to show pigs, to be involved in those activities. You know, one of the one of the, the turning moments for me was when I went to my daughter's POA show. You know, she shows lead line when she was three years old, and here we have a an organization, the, the Pony of America, that's focused on youth, focused on leadership development, focused on giving these kids confidence, and we're greeted when we get to the show by a group of, of animal rights people protesting these kids out enjoying their animals. You know, my, my four-year-old makes sure we feed the horse before we go into the house. You know, she doesn't get to go down and pet her pony goodnight. You know, she's upset the next morning. She has that love of animals, that love of agriculture, that, that enthusiasm that a lot of you have for, for you know, the issues that you're passionate about. I see that in my daughter, and that's what I, I fear. Uh, she won't have that opportunity, and that's why I believe it's important. Now, um, you talk about the family farmer. Critics are gonna contend that basically this is a shield for big ag, and that what you're really doing is removing the legislature and the people from the process of regulating uh, industry practices. So how would you, how would you that respond? That is the exact opposite of what this bill does. Uh, what this bill does is it only applies to Oklahoma citizens and residents of Oklahoma. It doesn't apply to the out-of-state corporate farms. It doesn't apply to the foreign farms. Uh, so that's written into the language. And it doesn't tie the hands of the legislature. Um, the bill as written says that the state may pass laws if they believe there's a compelling state interest. One of the, the prime examples that we use is uh, the castor beans. You know, in Oklahoma, there was a, you know, four or five years ago, there was a big push to grow castor beans. Uh, the state banned the growing of castor beans because they're used to manufacture rice, and, you know, a terrorist weapon. Uh, does the state have a compelling interest to prevent someone from growing castor beans to produce rice? And absolutely. 
you know, without a doubt. So there's nothing about this bill that would tie the hands of the legislature from doing something like that if there's a compelling state interest. So it's not a blanket ban on laws. Uh, we just have an extra layer that the state has to prove when they pass a law. Any other comments on the panel? Well, I think uh, I haven't seen the, uh, it, it, just the nature of our process, it hasn't come across my desk yet. Is it, it Representative Biggs, is it similar to last year's uh, it's, language? It's quite a bit different. Okay, well then I, then I probably should reserve comment. But, but last year I was concerned that it was, uh, you know, that it, it gave, ultimately gave a lot of uh, discretion, I think, to the, to the courts ultimately because it was, it was very simple. It had simplicity in its favor, but simplicity also meant that it was, um, you know, very vague in a sense. And and I, and I don't know what this year's looks like. Um, but you know, when you're when you when you don't want people to drive fast, you can approach that one of two ways. You can say that the speed limit is 50 miles an hour, or you could pass a law that says people can only drive a reasonable speed. Well, when you do that latter option, that has to be litigated because what is a reasonable speed? And and that was. That, that takes the power away from the legislature and gives it really to the courts. And that was my concern with last year's version. I, I haven't seen this year's version. We, we, to have an intelligent conversation, we should probably throw it up on the screen. But, um, but I think that's my concern and, and it's, it's something that I'm, I'm gonna be looking at when, when I finally am um, asked to consider that, which hasn't happened yet. Well, I just wanna add that um, as Representative Biggs has stated, um, oil and agriculture, that's Oklahoma. Uh, in a nutshell, and uh, the family farm is what I want to preserve as well. And um, being from a rural area, it's very important to my constituency that we protect the family farm. So, how is it unprotected if there are no consequences? What, what, are, what is the purpose of these rules if you don't have to get them compliant? He's lost all this year. The prime example was the, the horse show where we took kids, you know, there was about 200 kids with protesters saying you shouldn't ride animals, they should be set free, let them go, don't touch them, don't you, you know, let them be free. And you know, my three-year-old daughter doesn't understand that. You're absolutely right, they, ha they had the, the right to free speech, you're absolutely right. But what I fear is the direction of my daughter, my family. We have a farm that's been in our family since 1907. The, the farm my wife and I purchased was in the same family since 1910 until they sold it to us. I want to make sure my daughter has every opportunity that I had growing up, showing horses, showing kids, being involved in FFA, 4-H. You know, we just had the, you know, the largest youth livestock show in the nation here in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, ag and the, the youth, you know, they learned those skills, those opportunities to help help themselves grow. So I see this as a bill to help protect the way of life for my daughter to enjoy the same opportunities that I had, my, my five month old, the same opportunities that McGuire has. And that's why, you know, I feel is just as passionate about this issue as a lot of you feel about other issues. Another question from the audience. This bill, as written, this year's version, only applies to Oklahoma residents and Oklahoma citizens. So it doesn't apply to the corporate farms, the out-of-state farms, that, you know, the, uh, depends on how they're structured. It has nothing, no, no man, on, on its face, it only applies to Oklahoma residents and Oklahoma citizens that can take advantage of this constitutional protection. It doesn't apply to out-of-state companies. It doesn't apply to... But, but man, this bill has nothing to do with the toxic waste.
and ma'am, if you'd read this year's version of the bill, it does not apply to corporations. That's, I mean, last year's version, yes, it did. This year, we've made significant changes from the bill that was introduced two years ago. This only applies to Oklahoma citizens. The, out of, the, the case that you're citing with Illinois River is Arkansas companies that are dumping their chicken litter and then the water's traveling into Oklahoma. That's the case you're citing. This would not protect those Arkansas companies. Those would not protect those individuals who are polluting the water, as you say, from Arkansas moving into Oklahoma. And I was, I was honored to be asked to be here because, you know, the only time when we, both of us or groups like this have learning opportunities when you have healthy discussions. But when you have a healthy discussion, there's some point in time when you kind of have to agree to disagree. And, you know, and this is an example. This bill does not, I, I truly believe, I have other opinions that this bill does not apply to corporate farms or the, the Arkansas companies that pollute the water. But and there may be a few minutes to continue the conversation after, after we finish. I think we have time for one more question. I appreciate healthy discussion, but I can see that, you know, you have your followers there. <coughs> this is not a limit of democracy. What this is is a level of protection. You said it. Compelling state interest provides a level of protection. I believe in, and I'm passionate about protecting the rights of farmers and ranchers so your family can continue to enjoy your farm for the next hundred years. And that's what this bill does is it provides a level of protection for those farmers and ranchers. I know we could continue this conversation, uh, but we've got to keep the program moving along. I want to thank our panelists this morning. Let's join in a, a big thank you for Senator Holt and Representatives Denny and Beggs.